here we are. Good morning, everybody. Suicide. What does that mean? It's a theme that I want to talk about today. I've pretty much finished the whole section on the journey along the yellow brick road to the silvery shining city of phenomenology and all the obstacles that are there. But um, we are not leaving the phenomenological viewpoint behind because it underlies everything we talk about in this class. And um, so, so the, the new sections are kind of like special topics or special areas of focus, things I like to talk about. The first one today and probably next time also, maybe even extending into the one after that, is um, the phenomenology of depression, a.k.a. melancholia, as Freud calls it. We'll talk a little bit about what, what famous writing of his on this topic. And especially suicide, which has been uh, one of the things that has most preoccupied me, interested me, fascinated me, and hurt me in the course of all the years I've worked in this field and, and before they even began. Um, maybe I'll just rattle on about that, the personal angle first. If you were in my personality class, you heard, heard me tell of some of the suicides I had to experience um, as a young person. The first teacher that I really cared for in college, a man by the name of Jack Capehart, I was very close to, very friendly with. He was a Hellian behaviorist, but a sweet guy, kind of an unusual combination. Sweetness and behaviorism usually don't go together. Usually they're horrible, mean, asshole people. But in this case was an exception. Turned out he had, it was a closet Jungian. He read Jung at night and told me that late, much later, after I graduated, or almost. Any, anyway, never mind about all that. But um, insofar as I was capable of loving a teacher at this time, this was back in the early 60s at the University of Arizona, I had love for this gentleman. Uh, I didn't even know what love was in terms of a teacher, because I later found teachers that I adored and worshipped. And he was not one of those, but he's someone I liked a lot. A year after I graduated, he decided it would be a fine idea to go out into the Arizona desert outside of Tucson, city limits, pour a can of gasoline on himself and light himself ablaze, and burn to death, die horribly. So that, that was my, as far as I remember at least, that was my first encounter with the suicide of someone to whom I had been close. It was followed up six months later by the, the self-inflicted gunshot wound and death of another teacher of mine, actually the closest friend of Jack K. Park. Suicide is a little bit contagious, if you, in case you don't know this. One person kills himself, it kind of opens the door to that as a possibility for all the surrounding people. Like if you're a family member and a parent kills himself or herself, your risk of suicide goes up. But even if you have a good friend that kills himself, your risk goes up. Because it just you didn't really realize you could just do that. And somebody shows you, yes, it can be done, you might do it, decide to do it too. So Vincent Tempone was his name. Uh, these are co-authors on the first publication I had in psychology back from 1965, a behaviorist, learning theory, researchy thing that I did as an undergraduate. And my two co-authors, senior authors on the paper, both killed themselves, one by gasoline, the other by a gunshot. Uh, I've been haunted by their deaths ever since. And that's a long time ago, like 48 years ago or something like that. 45 years anyway since their deaths. Um, then a, a close girlfriend of mine that, that I had been just incredibly close to, more when I was like 18 and 19 years old, and it was it was a complicated relationship. And she had a child from somebody. Who, she got pregnant in high school, not from me. And this little boy and I got to be really close. And I became a kind of surrogate father for him for about a year and a half or two years. But the, this, this young woman was, I don't know how to put this guy, she was crazy. Okay, Meaning there were things going on with her that I did not understand and couldn't manage. I was too young, wasn't able to do it. I had to back off from this. I felt terrible about it because I loved her son a lot. Two years later, she hanged herself after I backed off. Not specifically, I don't think, because I backed off from her. I hope not, although I feel guilty about having done that. Why did I not hang on there and hang in there with her? and maybe do what was necessary 
to help her address what the issues were that led her to kill herself. I found out much later that she was a victim of profound sexual abuse by her own father. I hadn't known that during the time I was involved with her, but it was there, lurking in the background. And she was very sexually, this is going to sound really strange, guys, but uh, <laughs> I don't know how, without, without getting into some of the intimate non-details, I don't know how else to explain it. She was very sexually kind of free and open and all of this. Not with me, though. <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> I, I did not get the benefit of that. <laughs> but I got the, I get the closeness, but none of the sex. <laughs> all right. But still, there was love there. And I felt it for her, and she felt it for me. And it, it, almost like somebody she loved, she would not give herself to. She'd give herself to every other kind of asshole that would come along for <laughs> any reason at all. Including she got knocked up by one early. That's so where she, the baby came from. Anyway. <laughs> embarrassing. <laughs> well, why is it embarrassing? Nothing happened. And I'm, I'm happy that it didn't, because my guilt feeling would be even much greater had I become intimate with her, and I did not. But I, but I was intimate with her in other ways. And her little boy, the poor thing, he was the sweetest, nicest little three-year-old that I've ever seen in my life. When, when I would come over and visit her, he would be, George is here, George is here, and we'd play and throw balls and jump around and goof around. I pulled out from the situation because she was doing things that were just impossible for me to understand. I was too young and didn't know what has happened to severe trauma victims and the destructive things that they can get involved in. Just, you're, sometimes you're just too young to handle what you're faced with. Two years later, she hanged herself. She's dead. Her son became a childhood schizophrenic. He was five then, but he ended up in a psychiatric hospital, hallucinating, delusional. So he was destroyed also. So it was just a horrible trauma for me, losing her, losing her son, feeling terrible regret about not having been able to hang in there. Then following that, my closest friend in the world, a man by the name of Larry Schechter, I talk about him in the personality class. If you took it, you've heard this story. I'm not going to go into it deeply. Spiraled into a very bad depression, a very dark one, <coughs> and uh, shot himself with a 45. Okay, killed himself. And uh, I've never gotten over that. And a day does not pass in my life now, even though it's been 34, it's been 42 years or something since this happened. A day doesn't pass that I don't think of my friend Larry. I had moved out here to New Jersey by the time he killed himself. But he and I were such good buddies. He was a clinical psychologist. And he and I used to drive or fly or something to Wisconsin to this beautiful lake called Franklin Lake. And we would camp out and drink beer and talk about what a bunch of BS the world is and how much we hated who? Nixon at the time. <laughs> Nixon, I, one of some of my favorite memories are, are in a motel room with uh, Larry Schechter, this is before he killed himself, about a year, complaining and bitching about Nixon and watching the Watergate hearings. Oh my God, what a joy it was to watch those things crucify Nixon for a person who's like me, like a liberal left-wing nut. We just hated that the right wing was taking over our country. Of course, they continue to take it over, take it over, haven't they? Till now, thank goodness. Let's hope they don't get back in. Rick Santorum, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> no. no. But um, not, you're not teachers aren't supposed to tell their political views lest it shake the students. Are you guys shaped by whatever I say? I doubt it. Probably all just a bunch of liberal left wing freakos yourselves. <laughs> Worse than me. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> But he killed himself, and um, it was relatively sudden, although the warning signs were there in retrospect. Suicides are always, almost always like that. They shock and surprise the people around the, per the individual who's chosen, to, elected to die. But then you look back at the signs that were there in retrospect, wisdom of hindsight, and you just hate yourself for not having picked up on those and not having done what might have been necessary to prevent the thing in the first place. And maybe you even contributed to it in some way, or you, you review and you scrutinize all the things that happened, and what did I do to increase the likelihood of this? What did I not do to prevent it? And with my friend Larry, who I had great love for, and it was a time in my life where I didn't have many friends. I didn't have any friends, really, none, except for him. And we were just like kind of these two young losers, clinical psychologist guys who didn't know anybody except each other and had love for each other. And the guy kills himself? How are you going to even make sense of that? How am I going to deal with the guilt I feel? Here's what I should have done. 
His girlfriend told me that he had purchased a weapon about a month before he died. Why did I not get on an airplane when I heard about this, beat his door down, break open his closet, take the weapon, make sure I didn't get shot in the process, so I'm not going to allow myself to be shot. He's going to kill himself, and the only option is for me to be shot, kill yourself, do it. But why did I not do that? And then why did I not intervene in his life to give him or help him find what he needed to find in order to live? I live every day, I think of this. I don't torture myself every day about it, but the thought is always there. Suicide leaves a legacy for the survivors that will haunt them to their graves. It just does. Unless you find a way to dissociate that it's happened, then it's still eating at you. It's in your dreams, it's in your feelings, it's in your reactions. There's scarcely anything as destructive as suicide to other people. The people, the survivors of suicide, the children of suicides, the parents of suicides, when, they, when it's a child that does it, the, fr the good friends, the girlfriends, the boyfriends, and all this, the husbands, the wives. I want to talk about that, a, a, that too. So why am I telling you all this? Because it's been a personal issue. And then, of course, uh, two more stories I have. I'm not going to give them to you, the clinical details of them. But for the first 25 years of my own clinical practice as a, ther as a psychotherapist, I didn't have any suicides. I had two or three close calls where people tried to do it, ended up in critical condition in the hospital and almost died. But they lived. I was so happy. Oh, my God. So happy. But I. You, you know, you, 25 years is a long time for a serious clinician dealing with serious problems to go without a, without a successful suicide. I can just promise you something. Here's, here's a little treat in store for you in your future. If you become a clinician, social worker, psychologist, psychiatrist, or whatever, counselor, whatever you are, if you engage at all with serious psychological disturbances, you will be involved with someone who succeeds in committing suicide. It's a definite yes. To that. Maybe a miracle will happen and you won't have to deal with that, but it just does happen. Because you're, in, you're dealing with people in crisis that is so extreme, and they, take, they tend to take extreme measures and, and find extreme solutions. There's no more extreme or ultimately successful solution to bringing an end to one's troubles than the act of self-destruction. So get ready. If you go into this field, you're, you're going to have to deal with that. I've been, I did 25 years with no successful suicides. And I let myself be seduced by that a little bit. I started getting kind of arrogant. What a cool clinician I am. Like, I'm so cool. Like, everybody else knows that I had, had all these suicides. I know people with six, seven, eight suicides. I didn't have any. These people who have suicides are assholes. I'm cool. I don't have any. And then two of my patients killed themselves within a month. Like, suddenly, one, two, just happened, just like that. They even knew each other personally, the two people. And a day does not pass that I don't think of those suicides either. I, I don't torture myself about them, but I have thought about them profoundly, reviewed all the circumstances that were involved there, everything I did and didn't do for the people. The emphasis on didn't was right at the beginning and didn't let myself see how alarmingly serious the danger was. One went off the George Washington Bridge, kills you 99 times out of 100, killed him nice and good. He's fish food. Now, they never even found his body. And the other one drank a fifth of vodka, and on top of that, a massive amount of sl lethal sleeping medication, and on top of that, put a bag over her head with a nice rubber band around her neck, and whoosh, she's gone. Very effective. Okay? And uh, the work I was getting ready to do and could have and could have tried to do and might have been successfully done in both of those clinical cases is left as a kind of unexplained question mark, all that might have been. So these things just haunt me real badly. But I'm interested also in this phenomenology of depression and despair, and what are the experiences that lead us to the threshold of self-destruction. Human beings are the only animals that are known to kill themselves. None of the others do. Some of the others may do things that end up in their deaths. But only a human being even knows about death. Only human beings are aware that we are finite beings that are destined to die, and therefore that have the power to bring it on as a volitional act. So there's that. Um, suicide, suicide, suicide. So I just want to kind of rattle on about it and talk about some of the classical ideas in the field as to why this, as to what accounts for the existence of suicide. 
uh, tell some clinical stories about people that, that, where it's worked out a little better than the ones I just briefly skated over right now. And it's, this is kind of an upsetting topic. It's hard, might be hard to listen to parts of it. It's, uh, I can feel myself getting upset just by the fact that I brought up these questions, because uh, questions and memories. So when I start thinking about my old girlfriend and my best friend and my teachers and all this, I just get all sad inside and shaky, you know? <laughs> just the way it is. My mood returns to those times, and it's like they're just they're kind of frozen in time and never really processed completely and left behind. I can't, I can't, there's certain things that are so traumatic, I can never leave them behind. They'll always just be there. But I've kind of made peace with them in the sense that I will not let them destroy me or take me down, or preoccupy me so badly I can't have a good time with my kids, or walk my dogs and, and enjoy being out there in the sunlight with my dogs as they're eating goose poop, or whatever they're doing. For, for some reason, I just had a memory of one of my most beautiful moments with a dog named Kaz, who's long gone now himself. He did not kill himself. Animals are incapable of killing themselves. They, they might kill themselves by eating too much goose poop, but they don't do it on purpose. But one of my best memories of him, this is so boring, but why not go ahead and give a tangent? Why not? I'm out there in an early, early winter period. It's about 1988 or something. And in this giant park behind my house, my house has got a kind of forest behind it, but it's not real deep. And then on the other side of that is a park. I walked the dog in the park. And it was one of these beautiful mornings where it was just starting to snow, and the gorgeous snowflakes were coming down. The light from the uh, dawn was beginning to shine on the edge, and it just felt like a perfect moment. And there should be music playing, but it was just totally quiet. I was alone out there. I thought a man and his dog in the midst of the most beautiful natural scene. How lucky am I? And I looked down. My dog was inhaling vast quantities of goose poop. <laughs> and I just burst out laughing at the absurdity of the whole thing. I'm insane, so I go through things like this. Anyway, anyway. Suicide. Some of the worst moments of my life have been associated with suicide, and then it brings to mind one of the best moments, the goose poop moment with my dog, as I was telling you. Um, why, do, why do you think it is that people kill themselves? Like, why do they do it? Oh my God, because uh, there's no stronger drive most of the time in human life than the drive to protect your life and survive. People will do anything to survive, yet so many of them thousands upon thousands every year here in America and all over the world decide that's no good anymore. We're go going to die. And suicide is a phenomenon. It's danger and it's actuality that you can't escape if you enter the clinical, psychological, psychiatric world. It's everywhere present as a possibility. It's everywhere present just in life generally, but especially when you're in the territory of people who are um, have the fallen victim to great emotional injuries, and vast deep trauma, and self-destructive patterns that go on and on and on, so, which is what you're, do you're dealing with all the time. And you might think that um, going into the career as a psychotherapist would be kind of an easy thing to do. All you have to do is sit down, have these cool, deep conversations with people, and they get better. Though some of them get better, others maybe don't get better too well, so that's bad. But what you don't realize is that Often enough, not every instance for sure, but often enough, no, it's not just a matter of cool conversations. Life and death issues are at stake. And sometimes death occurs. And it may, always, it may occur in any particular case. And sometimes it can strike with almost no warning, or with the warnings being so indirect that you don't pick up on what they mean until after the fact. I'll tell you some stories like that. Um, let me give you a Freudian theory of suicide a kind of gross, crude formula that derives from one of Freud's most famous writings, an essay published in 1917 originally, almost 100 years ago, but it's still worth reading. Freud is like that. He's still worth reading. It doesn't matter that it's 100 or more years ago since he wrote these things. You might think, well, it's outmoded now. No, it's not. The world hasn't even caught up to half the things he did, even this, long, this much later. The title of the essay is Mourning and Melancholia. And it's an interesting, imaginative comparison and contrast of two states of mind, two sets of human experiences. One being mourning, meaning grieving. That is the experience 
of the emotional of the emotional turmoil following loss of someone who has been beloved to the person who has lost them. And the other one, melancholia, he probably uses the word melancholia, but it really just means severe depression. That's what it is, basically. Okay, so you don't worry too much about the language there. Um, in, in the essay, Freud wrote, he points out that there are profound similarities between mourning the emotional turmoil following loss and depression and melancholia, and emotional turmoil of another kind but with resemblances to mourning, but that also, almost always, seems to have to do with loss. There are many situations that trigger episodes of very bad depression, but the most common one of all is, is that of loss. Someone very close to the person, soon to be depressed, has died or left, rejected the person, or otherwise become inaccessible, unavailable to them anymore. So it's a disruption and a loss of a close, loving rela relationship. The relationship might be complicated in certain ways, but still in all, that's it. So mourning and melancholia have in common, they're both triggered by loss. Now, bad depressions, also called melancholia, sometimes are triggered by situations that are not on the face of it, loss. Like you can lose a job, that's not the loss of a person. You can have a great project that you've worked on for years upon years in your life that collapses with no hope of redeeming it, perhaps. So a kind of horrible sense of personal failure. There are a whole range of different things that are not exactly the death or disappearance of somebody beloved that may happen. But Freud's answer to that would be this, that uh, pretty much it all boils down to loss essentially every time, or 99 times out of 100. And if the surface of the situation is one where a person has like lost a career, that translates in the person's mind to whom it affects. It's, it's sort of the equivalent. They've lost a loved one. Maybe his career was a loved one in fantasy to him or to her, and now he's shut out from it. Or the event that triggers the depression itself triggers an early trauma of actual loss. Or a lot of times, very bad depressions that hit a person in, the, in midlife, made, let's say at age 40 or 45 years old, there's no, nobody has died or disappeared or rejected the poor depressed person, but you find out that there's been a death of a parent in childhood. And then you look at the stressful situations that happened in midlife, and you see how they called up the feelings from the, from the loss from childhood. So it's all about loss after all. So mourning and melancholy have in common, they stem from loss, says Freud. And I have found that borne out in my experience to be true. But I wouldn't want to say, I, I don't go quite the universalizing pathway that Freud does, but it, often enough, he's just right. Freud's always got his finger on something so important. Secondly, another thing they have in common is that in mourning, the grieving person withdraws or loses interest in the outside world, in the, in the areas that formerly were interesting, sources of pleasure and joy that motivated him or her to explore and do different things, activities, all this kind of shuts down. In melancholia, the same thing. One, one no longer is interested in the outside world. Formerly interesting things that were pursued or not can't be pursued anymore, the energy for them is lost. So that those two both, once again, they kind of, it comes from loss, both instances, there's withdrawal of interest in the outside world. Maybe a mood of sadness also covers both. Sadness obviously belongs to mourning, but so does it to depression. It's one of the dominant affects of depression. Depression is a complex set of different affects. That's one of them. But there's one that differentiates the two, and this is the key point in Freud's famous essay. A person who's called melancholic or deeply depressed turns on himself or herself and conducts self-criticism and self-attack and self-disparagement and aggression against himself or herself. He hates himself, is disappointed in himself, his self-esteem plummets, the feeling of worthlessness is there, and accusatory attitudes of oneself towards oneself dominate the clinical picture. This is missing in grief. People who are grieving don't feel worthless. They might feel life has become worthless without the beloved there anymore, 
but they themselves, their self-esteem doesn't go down, they don't conduct self-attack. So Freud, the, the theme of Freud's article is to account for this difference. They're very similar, they come from loss, they have all these qualities in common, but depressed, melancholic people attack themselves, grieving people do not. How can we account for this? He, and he offers a theory of it. And this will fold back into suicide in just a moment. You'll see what I'm talking about. He says, to understand this, we have to look at a phenomenon of the grieving process that one is that it was not originally observed by Freud. Others had observed it, but Freud made much of it. It's the process of what is called identification. When you're very close to someone, love them very deeply, intimately, truly, a family member, a mate, a child, a parent, um, if we lose them, we often form an identification with them. We become like them. Qualities that they formerly showed in their lives to us suddenly become qualities we are showing in our lives to ourselves and to others. Okay? It's like you suddenly become, a, in, in, in small ways or larger ways, you become a kind of duplicate of the person who has died or disappeared. And the, a, a theory of what, why this happens is that if we, if we become the person who has died or disappeared, then an illusion is created that they're still there. They're not there physically, they're dead, they're in the ground. They're, in, they're being eaten by the fishes at the bottom of the, of the Hudson River or whatever it is. But no, if you are that person in certain ways, then it's, it's, it's as if it's magical, but it's as if the continuity of their lives has not been interrupted at all. And an example of this, kind of personal, it's kind of a little embarrassing, but not too bad, was after my good friend Larry Schachter died in uh, Missouri, and I had moved out here. His girlfriend called me the next day after his body was found in a public park, and she called me, she said, um, hello, George. I said, yeah, who, who is this? She said, it's Mara Lee. And her name is Mara Lee. She didn't have to say another word. There was only one reason in the world she would be calling me. No, only one reason. He's dead. I said, is he dead? She said, yes, he is. I said, what happened? He went out last night with a 45, put it in his mouth, and blew the back of his head off with it. Oh, shit. <laughs> so it was really bad. So uh, I went out at, for the memorial service, which took place about three weeks later. And all kinds of people that knew him and also had love for him came to it. And we, we went to the park where he had killed himself and conducted the kind of memorial service right in by the bush he was under when he shot himself. It was so sad. We threw flowers on a little mound of earth and somebody had planted a tree. It was heartbreaking. It makes me really sad. I could start crying talking about it. But I found something happening to me while I was there. This is embarrassing. It doesn't make me look good, but just trust me. This is identification. I started getting all turned on to his girlfriend. I just started being so attracted to her. It was unbelievable. Like, oh my God, these surges of feeling coming out of nowhere. I did not act upon these things, and neither would she have either, probably. But later I realized I was being him. He was coming back to life. And it was as if I were going to replace him. And he would ha she would have in her life the man that had disappeared. The impulse was tremendously strong. People do this sometimes, and they get themselves in a jam. Because you get, then they start a whole relationship with somebody, and they're not capable of following it up, because it's part of the phenomenon of grief, the identification process. You see examples of this all the time if you study people in mourning. Famous ones would be like, like a senator dies suddenly and his wife runs for office. She's embodying in political action uh, identification with her husband. It's a normal part of grief. There's nothing pathological about it. It's a transitory thing that has to do with managing a discontinuity that just sharply interrupts the whole flow of life. And you kind of recreate the illusion of continuity through that. But it fades in time as your mourning and grieving, sorry, sorrowing process goes on. Okay? So Freud thought this was a very important part of mourning, not original with him, but that it has an additional aspect that explains the difference between melancholy and depression. He said this, that when someone loves someone else, and then that someone else vanishes through death or any other set of circumstances, in addition to the shock and sorrow, it is inevitable and flows out of human nature itself that there's going to be a response of rage. How dare you leave me? 
No one is immune from this, no matter how much you love someone. And no matter what the cause of their death was, at a deep, deep level, maybe the level of the child personality of this individual that survives inside each one of us, according to the Freudian method, and I think he's got, a, I mean, Freudian thinking, and there's a lot to what Freud says. There's going to be a part of us that is enraged, and outraged and enraged by the object, the other, daring to leave us. How could you do this? And there's a wish to strike out at them, but they're not there to be struck out at. And maybe there are other reasons going on where we can't let ourselves be infuriated at their disappearing. How could you do this to me? So Freud says a transformation begins to occur in which a kind of unbearable but intense rage against the abandoning other who has left us gets deflected and turned back upon the self. The enraging, abandoning qualities of the other that are present in the act of their dying or disappearing or rejecting us get incorporated into the I, into the ego, is the way Freud puts it. It's, an, it's, just, it's just like when you, you know, I incorporated the attraction to my friend's girlfriend and became, started living that out a little bit, but not literally, thank goodness, I'm so happy I didn't do that. But this is the same thing, except it's things that we hate in the other. We take them into ourselves. So that so the initial situation of being enraged and wanting to attack somebody turns into self-attack. Freud thought the key to the understanding of the depressive melancholic's hatred of himself is that it's rage against the abandoning other turned against the self. It's as simple as that. He calls it this. This is one of the most famous phrases in, in all of psychoanalytic writing. He sums it up. He says, the shadow of the object falls upon the ego. In German, it would be the shadow of the object falls upon the I, capital letter I. How I experience myself is suddenly shadowed by formerly the negative features of the object, the abandoning features that I've now incorporated into my sense of who and what I am. And so I attack myself. That's Freud's theory. Now, the next step would be suicide. So suicide being part of depression is an act of extreme aggression against one's own self. The Freudian theory is that all suicides are a matter of furious anger at somebody else, deflected upon the self. And if you talk to psychoanalysts about suicide, like I've talked about the various suicides that I was describing to you, my, my teachers, my friend, my girlfriend, and then my patients that, that killed themselves. And, and Freudian psychoanalysts, including sort of people who don't even consider themselves Freudian, but they really are, always respond in the same way. And it's this, they must have really been angry at someone, the idea of being furious anger, the wish to retaliate against somebody for something, that's what causes suicide. It flashes back upon one's own self, okay? After 50 years of thinking about this and experiencing it close at hand and studying it and reading the literature and studying vast numbers of creative geniuses who kill themselves too, that's been a sub-theme that I've been very interested in and help students study this, like the, the curious correlation between intense creativity and suicide. You risk, if you're a very creative artist or musician or, you know, writer of literature or something like that, your risk of suicide goes up pretty high. About half of them just end up killing themselves for one reason and another. Uh, what do I think of Freud's theory? I think it's mostly not right. I wouldn't want to say that somebody's suicide could not include a part that originates out of what was rage at someone that did something abandoning and rejecting. I wouldn't want to rule that out, but it seems to me that the answer to what causes suicide lies in the experience of hopeless despair. I take a kind of like soft phenomenological attitude and just ask, what are people feeling who are driven to this? And I have a very simple kind of image that it comes to. I, I think suicide happens when something has occurred in our lives that puts us in a position that is untenable. And there are a trillion things that can do this, a trillion situations that feel untenable, unbearable, and you can't cope. There's no solution. You can't see one at all. It's hopeless. You're up against something that you can't bear with you can't tolerate, but you also can't fix. And when you have, have that unfixable, untenable, unbearable situation, there's always a door that you can go out, and that's the door of death itself. 
So suicide to me is the last, it's a kind of solution of last resort to hopeless despair in the face of unbearable situations that have to be dealt with in some way. You can dive off the bridge, you can take the overdose. Hope I'm not upsetting her. You know, people walking out of here when I'm talking about suicide, it's very upsetting. But it's really important. Because it's it's like uh, it's it's one of the crucial phenomena that our whole field is concerned with, and you will experience it. So watch out and be ready for it when it happens, and forgive yourself, but look carefully and learn from it. Okay. So anyway, um, that's my theory. Very simple-minded theory. I don't know what the psychoanalysts would say. Subsurf, they say surface, superficial. It's all about rage, about rage. I don't reject what Freud would say or what people say there, because there's, a, there's going to be a component of that that's there. I, there's something to it. But still in all, if one is just looking at the, the experience itself, I think the characteristic subjective state associated with suicide is one of hopelessness. It's not one of rage, boiling rage that's flashing here and flashing there, and flashing against the self. It's, it's all over for me. I see no way out. There's always one way out. There's that one door. You just have to go up and open it and go through it, and you're, everything is taken care of. Okay. Um, suicide is the gift to others that keeps on taking. I'll just touch that and come back to that next time, probably. Like I think of the suicides that I've been around, and they and they they they, they run through my mind every day. And so I'm, something's taken from me every day as I do this. That, that's, it's like that. It's, suicide is not just an event that occurs in the lives of those around the person who has chosen to die. And then you just kind of say, well, it happened. Well, that's too bad. And you just move on, moving right along, moving right along. It haunts you. It haunts you. It keeps on taking from you. It's part of its amazing destructiveness. Um, here's what I think. It's, suicide is so destructive to other people. It's just about the worst thing you can do to someone, short of killing them. Like, um, you know, I, I've, uh, I, I've occasionally, like, asked myself, I ask myself these goofy questions. What's the worst thing a parent can do to a child? Like, what, what's the, what, the, what, what would be the rankings of the worst things they can do? And of course, I've seen so many destructive family situations. I can draw upon that experience and pull it out. And I, I'm pretty sure that my answer, if I were asked, to answer that question would be it's to commit suicide is the worst thing they can do. It's far worse than sexual abuse. Sexual abuse met like messes with your mind and does all kind of things that traumatize you pretty badly and get you all mixed up, make you feel bad about your body and all this, and then you make you feel betrayed by your own body and betrayed by your own parent. But there's nothing quite like suicide. It's what's a child to do with a parent who has elected to die. It just eats at that child, it eats at that child, and uh, can bring about vast destructive consequences to that child, even much later down the road, through the years, because it, it's a gift that keeps on taking. Okay, So suicide hurts people, there's no doubt about it, but I think the theory that it comes from rage and is designed to hurt in some way, however unconsciously and defensively twisted back on the self, to me it confuses the result with the motive. The motive is to escape despair. The result can be a terrible, destructive impact upon others, including someone who's left you. Let's say you're left, your husband leaves you, and you kill yourself. You, then maybe that 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 uh, self-administered death will create a destructive arrow into this husband that will last forever to the end of his life. But I don't see that as its primary purpose. I see it as an answer to hopeless despair. Now, I want to talk about a specific phenomenon. I'm going to tell you some stories now. Hang in with me. I need about 20 minutes to do this. It's about perfect. The stories I'm about to tell you, and, the, and they're summarized and condensed a little bit in Abyss of Madness in the chapter on depression. I forgot what chapter that is, six or something, seven. You guys have to read this. But I have a case study that I don't give in that, ch in that chapter that I want to give you. Uh, a paradoxical correlation. A sign of the danger of suicide that is so good to know, know about and is often so important to take note of and might lead you to prevent a suicide if you know about it, and it's this. 
people have noticed and written about a, 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 a phenomenon. It, it really go, it goes back a lot, hundreds of years even. I, I think I found some writings from ancient Greece or something that might even have mentioned this. It, it, the idea is this, that if you have a person in very severe, dark, deep depression, the danger of suicide isn't that great in the depths of the depression, but when the person seems to be improving for the first time and the gloom of their mood is lifting and their feelings are more positive and they start brightening up, that's when you should watch out because, the, because there's a positive correlation between the lifting of a severe depression in the initial period and the danger of suicide itself. There are countless stories of people who have been chronically depressed, really gloomy, feeling like dying, not able to do a darn thing about it because they can barely even get out of bed, and suddenly they brighten up and they kill themselves. Okay? Um, I learned about this as an undergraduate student. I didn't, I just noticed it in a book I read or something, but I hadn't, didn't really think about it, never took it too seriously. And in my first year as a postdoc, I want to tell you a clinical story now uh, in Kansas City. When I, when I was still beginning to realize what a serious business the field of psychotherapy really is when you're dealing with people in trouble and how it can, can be such life and death. And I was not taking it in, I was slowly taking it in. It was, what a stressful time that was. Don't forget, this is, I can't remember what I've told you guys and what I have, and I mix it up with personality. But when I did my postdoc, I was suddenly catapulted into a major psychiatric hospital with all the things the human condition can deliver that's destructive that happen to people. And I realized I didn't know anything. I memorized all these books, books piling up in this room to the ceiling, worthless. The cleaning staff knew more than I did, so I had to start over from ground zero. And this case was one of those cases that taught me a great deal. So anyway, I was um, running, a, I, I was the leader of a team in the daycare center. The daycare center had a total population of maybe 80 patients, divided into eight teams of 10 each. 10 patients each, and each team would have a leader, and I was a team leader. So I was responsible for 10 people. Daycare program people were very seriously disturbed. Most of them had been in the psychiatric hospital, were getting out, weren't, were too, still too disturbed to uh, be out, outpatients, just coming in a couple of times a week or something. They'd come there every day for eight hours. So I was working with these people. Let me tell you about one such case, a woman I'll call her Margaret. She was maybe 38 years old. I was a mere green 26 uh, at the time. And uh, her story was as follows. About four, five, or six months before her admission to the daycare program and my care that I was going to give her, although I was not prepared to do it, um, she had been married to a man she loved deeply, no children. He was a liquor store owner. And so he worked very hard, like 12 hours, 12 or 14 hours a day in his liquor store, from 10 to 10, 12 hours a day, let's say. And her life was built around him and their act shared activities together. And she was stable, and she, and she wasn't a terribly accomplished person in her own right, but she centered on being a good homemaker for her husband. I don't know why they didn't have children. I think one of them was sterile, probably what it was. I don't even remember that part. One fine evening, uh, some creeps came into the liquor store, and they had a gun. And they decided they wanted all the money. And so they demanded all the money. He gave them all the money, and they decided it would be best to shoot him so they weren't caught, because he might identify them otherwise. So they shot him to death. Uh, they were never caught. Most murderers, they don't catch the murderer. The murderer just gets away. You get the idea from the television that they always get the murderer wrong. The murderers just escape free. Murder somebody else. Watch out. There might be some out there. Anyway, I don't know why I'm saying that. I'm trying to add some humor into my bleak, bleak story. It's not too funny, though, is it? <laughs> not funny at all. It's funny. How are you think it is funny? It's funny. Anyway, this is, a, this is a story that keeps on getting sadder because uh, so she, so she, her, her relatives watched as she kind of disintegrated in the aftermath of her husband's death. They had the big funeral and memorial service and everything, but she, she got real deeply depressed. 
and uh, just basically was a, giving out a litany of complaints about what had happened in her life. And for the next weeks and months, one of her sisters lived with her, but all she would do is sit there in the morning, not taking care of herself, not getting dressed, not fixing up her appearance, not taking an interest in anything, just sitting in a chair, moaning, complaining, groaning about the unfairness of the fact that, that her husband had been murdered. And she wasn't worried so much about the men not being caught. That was part of it, but that was the least of her problems. It was the fact that her husband was gone. She couldn't stand it. And so they finally gave up trying to help, them, help her themselves and brought her to our hospital complex. And she was asked about suicide. She said she wasn't going to kill herself. She was put in the daycare program and, and given to the, the phenomenal therapist, George Atwood, a man who knew nothing, but was faking it in my suit and all this stuff, looking cool, looking very together, very brilliant, hiding the fact that I was at a zero level of clinical experience. So I sat down with her, Mrs. Smith, I'll call her, Margaret, and she told me the story of her husband's death. And I'll imitate her a little bit, and it sounds like I'm mocking on her, and it's okay to laugh if you want to about this, but it wasn't funny and it's not a laughing matter. But sometimes you just have to laugh. She spoke in a real nasal tone. It was really grating on your, on your, it, it, when you listen to it, it was really get to you, but it was like, I just, Dr. Atwood, it's just not fair what happened to me. Why did God do this to me? You tell me, why did God do this, Dr. Atwood? It was like that. It's just not fair. This shouldn't have happened to me, and why did God do it to me? So this is just all day long at the daycare center. That's all she would do. It would be just silence staring at the floor, or if she talked at all, it would be that. She was unresponsive to anything else. You could get her to answer a question or two. What's your name? Where? What's your address? She'll answer that. But in relating to the other patients or anything, she was in a self-enclosed kind of envelope of miserable complaint about the unacceptable state of her life. Are you guys with me so far? So, I, so she was one of my 10 people. The other nine were probably raging, paranoid, schizophrenic, so I was under a lot of pressure. She was difficult. She wasn't out outwardly psychotic, like off in another world or delusional or anything like that, but she was deep into her complaints, 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 and all circling around the depressing, tragic, unacceptable episode of her husband's murder. So um, I talked to her every day, at least half an hour, three days a week for a full hour, I tried to encourage her to go to groups to do play, play ping pong and join the bingo club and help feed the fish in the aquariums we had. All this other kind of goofy stuff they put in mental hospitals like fish in aquariums and ping pong tables and pool tables. She wouldn't really get into any of that and just complain, complain. And each one of our meetings was the same. It's just not fair, Dr. Atwood. Why? Why? All right. And there would be, we had group therapy sessions three times a week where the, my team would all meet together, the patients would, and I would run the group. And other, groups, other group members would ask her, how, how are you doing, Mrs. Smith? I'm not doing good because it's not fair what happened to me. And I could see the other patients were starting to hate and despise her. Because this is obnoxious to listen to it like this. But if you told her it was obnoxious, it wouldn't do any good. She'd just deep, more deep into it. Okay? So anyway. So about... Four or five weeks in, she came to me and she said, I'm not sleeping well, Dr. Atwood. So that's the same tone of voice. I'm just not sleeping well. well Couldn't you help me get some sleeping medication? I think maybe I would do better if I slept more. All right. I'm imitating her now. It's obnoxious, but it was like that. I said, sure, if you want to sleep better. How about, how about we'll give you some chloral hydrate? You know, I'll get the doctor to prescribe it for you. No, no, chloral hydrate, no, no, something a little stronger. How about Nalyadar? It's a, it, it's, a, it's a dangerous drug for sleeping. So I managed somehow to induce the psychiatrist to prescribe a small amount of this Nalyadar to her, like an eight day, seven or eight days on it. Um, and then after that, the next day she came back, and the day after, and the day after, in the daycare program, and I noticed she dressed up suddenly. She's wearing these nice, this nice dress, whereas before it had been these shitty, 